Hi, welcome back. I'm scientist Kate. This is grade three, weather and climate. Lesson 3.6, evaluating evidence about climate, part one. For this lesson, you will need a pencil or something to write with, and you could really use some crayons or markers. If you don't have crayons or markers though, it's okay. You're also gonna need notebook page 52. It's called visualizing future weather. What's the weather like where you are today? Here in Seattle, it's pretty rainy and gray, and it's also a little cool. Are you ready to do some science today? I bet you are. Let's go. All right, welcome back. Do you remember the last lesson? We compared Seattle's average temperature and precipitation to three other major cities. And we were trying to find a city that has a climate that's similar to Seattle's. So today we're gonna study how can we predict what the weather in a place will be like many years from now? Because that would be really useful to be able to do to help us pick a place for our orangutan reserve. Have you ever thought about what the weather might be like on your 18th birthday? That's several years in the future, right? Well, if you think about it now, you could go ahead and pick out an outfit that you might wanna wear on your 18th birthday. We're gonna use notebook page 52 to do that. So let's review the directions. We're gonna use our local weather graphs to visualize and draw on page 52. So here's what you do. I'm gonna show you some weather graphs and you're gonna find the month you were born on the graphs for local temperature and precipitation. Then you're gonna visualize what you would be wearing and doing on your 18th birthday. Draw a picture of what you visualized and then share your drawing with a partner. Now, you probably don't have a partner at your house, but I bet there is somebody you could show your picture to. Now, I'm gonna model this for you first so that you have a really good idea of what to do when you do it on your own. These are the two temperature graphs we saw for the climate of Seattle in the last lesson. Do you remember these graphs? Awesome. So the green one says average high temperatures in Seattle, Washington, and the blue one says average total precipitation in Seattle, Washington. Now, remember that these graphs aren't from a specific year. They're not from 1989. They're not from 2001. These are graphs that are made from average data that scientists made by looking at years and years and years of data and finding what the average temperature is for each month and precipitation. So, um, I'm going to do this first for my own birthday, and I'll show you how to do it. My birthday is July 19th. I'm a summer baby, and looking at these graphs, I'm going to point to the month of July. And then I'm going to point over here to the month of July. So this is what you're going to do with your own birthday month when it's your turn. So looking at these graphs, for temperature, I should expect around 70 to 80 degrees. And I figured that out by going to the top of the July bar and then going over here and seeing that it's in between 70 and 80 degrees. Now I'm gonna compare that to the temperature benchmarks that we used in chapter one. Do you remember that? It shows you like what each temperature kind of looks like. So 70 degrees is about what your classroom feels like. And 93 degrees was what temperature um, chocolate melts at. So I can expect on my birthday for it to be warmer than the classroom, but not hot enough to melt chocolate. Now let's look at the precipitation. July, great. It looks like there's not going to be a big chance of rain in July. There's very little rain here in Seattle in the summer like that. So I'm going to show you three outfits that I've picked out for my birthday. Now y'all, here's a little secret, but don't tell anybody. I'm way past my 18th birthday. So let's say that I'm planning for hmm, my 40th birthday. Here are three outfits that I want you to look at and choose which one best matches this weather data. Ready? The first outfit is an orange sweater, jeans, and boots. The second outfit is a jean jacket, a tank top, shorts, and sandals. And the third outfit is a heavy raincoat, jeans, 
and rain boots. Take a look at these three pictures and compare them to the weather I can expect on my 40th birthday. Pick an outfit that you think looks right. Did you pick an outfit that you think matches the weather data? Point to it right now. Are you pointing to this outfit? It's like I read your mind. The outfit with the orange sweater is probably a little bit too heavy and too warm for this temperature that I'm expecting. So 70 to 80 degrees is pretty warm. Um, and then this outfit here on the bottom is way too much for July. We're not expecting rain, so I can leave the rain boots at home in the raincoat. And I'm not gonna need gloves and a heavy coat because it's gonna be pretty warm. So this outfit is actually the best outfit for me to wear. Awesome. Now it's your turn. I'm gonna put these graphs up and I want you to find your birthday month and draw what you might be wearing on your 18th birthday. Pause the video now, complete page 52, and then meet me back here. All right, welcome back. Remember, we want to figure out which island will continue to have the best weather for orangutans for many years to come. We're going to look at new evidence from the islands today. Are you ready? Great. Before we do, I want to remind you about evaluating evidence. Do you remember what it means to evaluate something? It means to judge like how useful it is. So in chapter one, we were trying to compare one place to another and we decided that a piece of strong evidence must be measured in the same way that meteorologists measure. So for example, if we're measuring temperature, we wanna be measuring in degrees Fahrenheit. And if we're measuring rainfall, we wanna be measuring in millimeters, right? And we decided that a piece of weak evidence would be things that are measured in a different way, like that's not consistent. And we also don't want evidence that's just a description. So it's not strong evidence for us to say, oh, it's really hot and rainy outside today. Like that's not an actual measurement. Then in chapter two, we were predicting what the weather will continue to be. Remember how y'all did that with scientist Cynthia? And y'all decided that a piece of strong evidence would be a month of data because it gives you such a bigger time span and a weak piece of data or I'm sorry, a weak piece of evidence would be one day of data. It's just not enough to be able to predict what might happen in the future. So today we're gonna to be comparing some new evidence, right? Take a look at this evidence card. On the top, it says, someone measured the temperature every day for the month of June, 2010. The range was 55 degrees to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The evidence on the top gives the temperature range in June 2010. Does it measure in an official meteorologist's measurement? Yeah, it measures in degrees Fahrenheit and it tells us the temperature range for one month. What about on the bottom? What do you notice about this piece of evidence? This piece of evidence it shows the average monthly temperatures for every month in 2010. So the evidence on the top is one single month of June, and the evidence on the bottom is one entire year for all of 2010. What does the evidence on the top allow us to predict? Think about it and tell me your answer. Yeah, we could use it to predict the temperature on the next few days of that month in 2010. What else? We could use it to predict the June temperature in other years. So we could look at that temperature range and say, hmm, if it was between 55 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit in June 2010, we could expect the same thing in June 2011, June 2012, June 2020, June 2030. We could use it to predict years in the future but only for the month of June. What does the bottom piece of evidence allow us to predict? Yeah, we could predict the temperature in every other month in any other year. So on the top, we could use that for just June, 
But on the bottom, we could use that for the entire year. I could predict the expected temperature for any year in the future and any month of the year. So which piece of evidence would make a stronger argument for the island that would have the best weather for orangutans in the future? Yeah, I'm probably going to go with the bottom piece of evidence because if we just look at the islands in June, what if one of the islands suddenly gets freezing cold in January? Or what if it dries up and, and there's no rain for the orangutans in some month? We need to look at the entire year in order to be able to make predictions. So just to wrap up, one month of data can help us predict the weather in the next few days, but that doesn't mean the place will be that same way every month. One year of data helps us predict future weather because the weather in one year is close to what the weather will be every year. So this is a place's climate. And climate is what we need to know to pick the island. So we're going to add a new row to the bottom of the evaluating new evidence chart. In the last chapter, chapter two, we were trying to predict what the weather would be for the next few days. And a month of data will let us do that. But now we want to predict what the weather will continue to be for years and years and years, right? We need to know that for the orangutan reserve. So we need one year of data. And now one day and one month are going to be weak evidence. All right, thanks for joining me for lesson 3.6, Evaluating Evidence About Climate, part one. When you come back for part two, we're going to sort out some evidence to see what evidence is strong and what is weak. And hopefully we will be able to decide which island is the one we want to make an argument for to the Wildlife Protection Organization. Thanks so much for joining me today. And until I see you for part two, stay safe and stay curious. Bye.